What you just watched wasn't a fan recreation of Devastator's death scene from the 2009 blockbuster hit Transformers Revenge of the Fallen, but actually an animation that was crafted by the talented animation team behind the film. And hours upon hours upon hours of animation just like this was created during the production of all five Michael Bay Transformers movies. Despite appearing rough and unfinished, these animations played a crucial role in production helping to refine the story, pacing, and overall look and feel of each film. These animations are called animatics, and they're essentially a rough draft of the film. They allowed Bay and team to choreograph and visualize each shot before going out to film them. And here's a video of Bay and the team explaining the usefulness of animatics in detail. Animatics are just becoming a better tool. It's basically a Saturday morning cartoon of the movie. From that, they'll show us what's going to happen. You can work out some very complicated camera moves, especially when you're working with a height difference of 28 feet, 40 feet. So you automatically start embracing ideas of animation and physics and trying to incorporate that in your little mini movies. Now, despite animatics being created for virtually every shot of each film, at this time, we unfortunately only have access to around 100 of them. And the reason why we even have access to so many in the first place is because a majority of them were scattered throughout the special features for each film. And trust me, compiling them all for this video was no easy task since I had to go through over 12 hours of footage just to get them all. Luckily for me, Revenge of the Fallen and Dark of the Moon gave me a bit of a break since in their special features they have a dedicated section for animatics that the others don't have. These animatics had commentary from director Michael Bay and pre-visualization supervisor Steve Yamamoto. However, I still had to go through the regular special features in order to find a handful of animatics that were not present in this dedicated section. And for context, the Dark of the Moon special features is three hours long. And you know how many animatics I found? Five. But that's okay, since by putting myself through that over the course of two days, I can now finally show you every single animatic that has been made publicly available to my knowledge. Now, to preface, not all of these animatics are for scenes. Some are transformation studies, walk cycles, and fighting tests, which I included since they are still animatics. So sit back, relax, and grab your favorite snack, since I'm going to take you on an hour-long journey discussing all of these animatics in detail. So let's find out what stayed the same, what changed, and and what could have been. Nowadays, I'm doing less storyboards and animatics are just becoming a better tool. All right, so it's time to start where it all began, that being good old Transformers 2007. The first animatic to take a look at would be this one of Ironhide and Bumblebee protecting the humans from Starscream. Here we can see Bumblebee and Ironhide looking a little bit different. That's because of these models for them are directly based on their early Ben Proctor concept art designs. Another cool thing to take note of is that they would have had the Allspark fly out of Bumblebee's hands and to land on the ground. As we know, this shot did not make it into the final film since it just cuts to the humans recovering from the blast. However, a similar scene happened in the Transformers movie adaptation comic, which was based off of an early draft of the script. Moving on to the next animatic, here we have a scene where Bone Crusher is causing some havoc on the road. And this segment of him flipping cars is completely different to what we ended up getting. Since in the film, Bone Crusher had more screen time ramming people off the road instead of flipping them with his claw. So it's cool to see that the claw was going to have more screen time flipping cars. The next animatic to take a look at would be this one of Frenzy exiting Air Force One. And something right off the bat that you can notice is Frenzy's eyes. As we know in the film, they are blue. However, here they're red. That's because of this design for Frenzy was based off of concept art. To this day, it's still unclear why his eye color was changed to blue, especially since he's a Decepticon. Moving along, we have the next animatic, which is a transformation sequence for Megatron. And I'm honestly stumped on what scene this is supposed to be. We know it's not the scene where he flies into Optimus since we have an animatic for that. This leaves two other scenes, that being the one where he shows up in LA for the first time, or the scene where he flies in to steal the Allspark from Sam. Thing is, in both of these scenes, he lands on the ground in robot mode, while here he just flies away. So either this could be a really old draft for one of those scenes, or it's a pre-visualization for a scene that never made it into the movie. However, I think the most likely answer is that this scene was just a transformation test to visualize how Megatron would transform. Now, another thing to touch base upon in this animatic is Megatron's head design and why he has blue eyes. Like the other bot designs I talked about, Megatron is no different in the fact that his design was based off of 
of early concept art. The reason why he was considered to have blue eyes despite being the Decepticon leader is still a mystery. However, his head design was changed to the final version we got thanks to us fans. You see, when Megatron's concept art got leaked, fans were not happy and they made sure that Bay knew it. And after seeing how bad the backlash got, Bay changed the design. You know, I would take some of the constructive criticism of stuff they saw. I actually changed Megatron's face when they opposed with that much. Hopefully the same thing will happen to a certain someone, but only time will tell on that one. With Meg squared off, let's turn our attention to the next animatic. And here we have one for the scene where Sam and Michaela meet the Autobots. And as we can see, Optimus is looking very blue and Ratchet is looking very red. That is because these designs are both based off of early concept art. Jazz's design like the rest follows the same song and dance. As for Bumblebee and Ironhide, it's unknown why they are using completely different models here considering they do have ones that look a lot closer to their concept designs. But maybe those updated models were not finished when this animatic was created. And this is likely the case since this Bumblebee model shows up in the 2005 Transformers movie announcement trailer. Moving on to the next animatic, this one's a shorter one, and here we can see Bumblebee protecting Sam and Michaela from an incoming barricade that we cannot see. There's not too much to say here besides the fact that the general camera movements for this animatic are roughly the same as what we got in the final film. Sliding over to the next animatic, we have a few for Scorponok. And a common trend that you will see is that he's missing his head. Besides that, in this scene we can see that he pops out of the sand to attack the soldiers at the village. Here we can see that he would have killed one of the soldiers when he jumped out, which as we know did not happen in the final film. Moving on, we have another Scorponok animatic, and here we can see the scene where he's about to impale Lennox. The only thing to note here is that the camera work goes down and around while in the film the camera stayed relatively level and panned back. And out of these two shots, I honestly like the dynamic shot that was in the animatic over what we got in the film. Moving on to the second to last Scorponok animatic, here we can see the scene where he takes down Sergeant Donnelly. And in this animatic, Donnelly has a lot more situational awareness compared to the film. Another thing to point out here is that the camera starts out behind Donnelly and then cuts to a front shot. While in the film, we never got this back shot and both were from a front angle. Now, taking a look at the final solo Scorponok animatic, here we can see the money shot from the trailer where Scorponok barely misses the soldiers. Interestingly enough, one of the soldiers would have rolled out of the way. Though this never made it into to the movie, it was actually filmed with the actor for Fig doing the role. Taking a look at the next animatic, we have one for the scene where Blackout is about to transform. There is not much to say here besides the fact that I prefer the film version since it zooms in on Blackout as he powers down, unlike here where it's just a pan. Now taking a look at the next animatic, we have the scene where Scorponok ejects out of Blackout, and here he kinda just falls face first into the dirt. The film version is definitely a lot better since he does some acrobatics in the air before hitting the ground. Even Transformers of the game did this better with Scorponok jumping off a of Blackout. Moving on to the next animatic, we have the scene where Captain Archibald with Wiki discovers Megatron. Now, if you're wondering why this animatic has Japanese subtitles, that's because I took it from Paramount Japan's YouTube channel, since they were the only ones to have an archive of this animatic on the web. That's because this animatic was a BD Live exclusive, and unfortunately that service has been shut down for several years now, leaving anything BD Live related scarce on the internet. And I plan to do a video on BD Live and all the Transformers lost media associated with it, so stay tuned for that video. Now, returning our focus back to this animatic, we can see that Megatron's face would have been a lot closer to the captain, unlike in the film where it was further away. Another thing to point out is that it looks like a scene was planned for the glasses to bounce off of Archibald. This would have been nice to see since in the film they just show up farther away after Megatron zaps him. Speaking of Megatron, in the next animatic we get to see a scene of him locked up at Sector 7, and funny enough for some reason he doesn't have a face. Another thing to point out is that there is this walkway in front of him that did not make it into the final cut. This was likely done since the walkway partly obstructs him as the camera gets closer, which wouldn't look good considering this is Megatron's grand reveal. Now, switching gears onto the next animatic, we have the scene of Ironhide getting out of the pool. Interestingly enough, his protoform here has red eyes, which is strange since Decepticon protoforms were not planned for the first film and only became a reality in Revenge of the Fallen. Now, moving on to the next animatic, we 
we have one for Blackout's death scene, or should I say Bone Crushers? This is particularly strange since in every piece of media retelling the events of the 07 film, Lennox is shown killing Blackout in this manner, while Bone Crusher is killed by Prime. I think the most likely answer as to why Bone Crusher is appearing in Blackout's spot is because he was used as a stand-in for Blackout in the animatic but it's unclear why this decision was made. Another thing to point out here is that Bone Crusher's design is based off of his concept art, thus explaining why he has a visor. And with that said, that was the last full screen animatic that appeared in the special features. So now let's take a look at all the animatics that appeared in Transformers HUD. Now you might be wondering, wait, what's Transformers HUD? Well, Transformers HUD, also known as Transformers Heads Up Display, was a feature on the DVD. It utilized the picture-in-picture -picture feature of some Blu-ray players to display smaller videos and images on top of the main movie, providing an immersive experience for fans. And I plan to create a video diving into all the fun facts and crazy stories that Transformers HUD provided, so stay tuned for that video. Now moving on to the first HUD animatic, we have to see in a frenzy on Air Force One. And interestingly enough, he wouldn't have fully transformed like he did in the film, but would have moved back before transforming. He would have also had his eyes out the whole time, unlike in the film where he's fully transformed. Another change is the camera angle when he's moving around in Air Force One. In the animatic, we see him from afar while in the film the camera was right next to him. Another change that was made is that Frenzy would have made it into the cargo hold without Tracy's help. As we know, in the film, Tracy finds Frenzy in the elevator and brings him down to the cargo hold, while in the animatic, Frenzy is already in the cargo hold. Now taking a look at the next animatic, this one is for the scene where Optimus is trying to hide Sam and Michaela from Sector 7. And for the most part, there's not too terribly much to say besides the fact that it looks like they were planning to have a scene of Sam and Michaela looking back at the helicopters, which would have actually been pretty cool to see. Another thing to point out here is that Bumblebee is sporting his 1977 Camaro all alternate mode. While in the film, he had his concept Camaro alternate mode. This was likely done since they possibly did not have a model for the concept Camaro when this was created. With that said, let's take a look at the next animatic, which is of the Autobots at the Observatory. And here we can see that Prime has an updated head that looks a lot closer to his final design. Another thing to point out here is that Jazz seems to confront Prime up close with him being visibly upset that Prime is deciding to let Bumblebee die. And this is something I really wish made it into the final film, since it gives more character to Jazz. Speaking of Jazz, his model here has also been slightly updated, but it clearly is still based off of his early concept art design. Another thing I found is that we can see a weapon behind Ironhide's back, which coincidentally looks a lot like the weapon he got from Wheeljack in Dark of the Moon. Among other things, the scene of Bumblebee being experimented on by Sector 7 is not present here. Now, there's a little bit more extra footage for this animatic that appeared in the BD Live Extra Metal in Motion. And here we can see the exterior of the observatory as well as Optimus pondering and telling the boss to roll out. With this animatic squared off, let's move on to the next one where we can see Nokia Bot come to life. And instead of being a Nokia, he's actually an iPod. You see, he was always meant to be an iPod, but when Michael Bay went to Apple to see if they would let him use the iPod in the movie, Apple unfortunately refused. So Bay and the team ended up using a Nokia phone instead. The robot mode that we see here comes from his concept art, and it's cool to see that Nokia Bot was originally going to have electricity powers, but it seems like those powers were dropped in favor of him having a missile launcher. With Nokia Bot's animatic squared off, let's move on to the next one, which is an animatic of Bumblebee shrinking down the Allspark. Now, there's not too much to say here besides the fact that the Allspark's transformation looks a lot like the Transformium we saw in Age of Extinction. However, these similarities are likely unintentional, and could be attributed to the limitations faced by the animatic animators. Moving on to the next animatic, here we can see the scene where Bumblebee gets up after getting his legs blown off by Starscream. And to me, this interpretation seems a lot more brutal, since Bumblebee is looking at his severed legs and has to use a pole in order to crawl on the ground. The the film version was a lot more tame since he could still crawl around and did not have to see his severed legs. Another thing to point out here is that Ironhide was originally going to be present in this scene, since as we know in the film he disappears after the blast and we don't see him again until he faces off against Brawl. Now taking a look at the next animatic, we have one for the fight scene between Optimus and Megatron. Something right off the bat that you can notice is that Megatron has a Decepticon logo on his chest. 
Though he never had this in the film, this detail is definitely taken off some concept art depicting him with the logo. Some other things to point out is that the soldiers would have been ready to help Prime fight Megatron, which as we know did not make it in the final film. Some other interesting details are in regards to slow motion. In the film, there is a slow motion scene when Megatron slams Optimus into the building. However, this slow motion ends once they hit the ground. However, the animatic has this flip. When Meg slams Prime into the building, there is no slow motion, but there is for when they fall and wrestle on the ground. Another interesting tidbit is that in this animatic, Megatron is on the bottom and Prime is on the top. However, in the film, they're swapped. Another interesting thing is that the scene where Megatron throws Prime would have originally been viewed through a window. Furthermore, in the animatic, Optimus doesn't even get a chance to pull out his Ion Blaster, since Megatron just puts him down and shoots him into the building as soon as he gets the chance. Lastly, it seems like the animatic animators left a little easter egg in this scene, that being the building called the Bank of Megatron. Now moving along to the next animatic, here we have the scene of Sam running away from the Decepticons. Something cool to note here is that Blackout is using his back rotor blade as a weapon instead of the one on his arm. Though he was never shown doing this in the film, several pieces of media depict him being able to use the back rotor as a weapon. Furthermore, in this clip, Blackout gets shot, which is something that we did not get to see in the film. The last thing to note in this animatic is that during the Starscream segment, when he flies off, Ironhide and Ratchet are not present, despite him shooting in their direction. Now taking a look at the next animatic, here we have the scene where the soldiers are fighting off Brawl, and in this scene we can see that Brawl still has both of his arms, meaning that the scene where the Autobots jump him was possibly not fully drafted up yet. Now, a cool scene in this animatic that we did not get to see in the film would be this shot of Michaela looking through the tow truck's windshield, and seeing the absolute carnage caused by Brawl. Interestingly enough, it doesn't seem like the concept of Bumblebee's shoulder cannons were drafted up yet considering he doesn't use them here. Lastly, I prefer the way Brawl dies in this animatic, since the camera gets to see his face while in the film it's just his chest. With that said, let's take a look at the second to last HUD animatic. And here we can see the scene where Megatron confronts Sam for the Allspark. Something that's kinda strange here is that the ground appears to break beneath Sam's feet. But considering there's a cut here, it's likely that Megatron shot at Sam, causing the ground to break. This can be backed up since after Optimus catches Sam, Optimus starts shooting at Megatron. Now you might be wondering, how does this exactly prove Megatron shot the ground? And well, if we take a look at the movie adaptation comic, we can see that Megatron fires at the ground causing Sam to fall, and a few panels later Optimus shoots at Megatron as they're falling. Now compared to what we got in the film, I do like Megatron using his flail over his blaster, but I do think it would have been cool to see Optimus fire on Megatron as they fall. Now another strange thing is that in this scene while they're falling, it cuts to a completely different animatic and I will cover this one once we get to the fight studies portion of the video. Now finally moving on to the last animatic, it is just an extended cut of Blackout's death scene. The only thing to point out here is that in this animatic we get a third person view of Lennox watching the body fall to the ground. I actually much prefer the first person shot that we got for the film. It's also interesting to note that he would have stayed on the bike, but I believe the film's version of him falling off the bike is way more realistic. And with that said, that covers all the animatics that appeared in Transformers HUD. Now let's take a look at all the transformation tests, run cycles, and movement studies. Starting off with the transformation tests, we have one for the leader of the Autobots. When you compare this to what we ended up getting, we can definitely see that this was the blueprint for that awesome transformation we got to see. One key aspect to note here is the uncoiling of the tires, which is a detail that did not make it into the film's final cut thanks in part to Aaron Archer. As the director of Boys Design at Hasbro, he emphasized to the production team the importance of ensuring that all the parts on the vehicle ended up somewhere on the robot, since the Transformers are transforming and not morphing. This philosophy would carry over to the other transformation tests moving forward, like this one for Jazz, this old test for Bumblebee based on his concept art design, and even older tests for Bumblebee that looks nothing like any of the concept art we have seen for him, and this one for Barricade that was based on some early concept art where he was depicted as a Crown Victoria. 
Some other transformation tests we have access to would be this one for Megatron leaving Sector 7. This one for Bone Crusher, which is particularly interesting since we never got to see his full transformation in the film. And lastly, this one for Soundwave. And yes, you heard that right. You see, Soundwave was originally going to star in the Transformers 2007 movie. He would have fulfilled both Barricade and Frenzy's roles, hacking into the CIA headquarters as a portable stereo, and then transforming into a Humvee to track down Sam Witwicky. This plan changed when Michael Bay decided to minimize the amount of mass shifting in the film, resulting in a change to turn Soundwave into a helicopter that would attack the army alongside his pet Ravage. But as changes to the script were made, screenwriter writers Roberto Orki and Alex Kurtzman came to the conclusion that they would not be able to do Soundwave the justice he deserved. And so, Soundwave and Ravage were changed to Blackout and Scorponok. But still wanting to have a remnant of Soundwave in the film, the screenwriters added Frenzy in as a homage to the almighty cassette player bot. This design for Soundwave would appear in one other animatic, that being this concept scene of Bumblebee transporting Sam to some construction site, which is a scene that never appeared in the film or any media to my knowledge. But if you look in the background, it appears that Soundwave's body is lying in the rubble, alluding to the fact that Bumblebee would have been the one to kill Soundwave, which actually did end up happening in Transformers Dark of the Moon. Now, with all the transformation tests out of the way, let's take a peek at all the run cycles that are available to us. The first one we have would be this one of Optimus Prime's run cycle, and compared to what we got in the film, this is pretty spot on to what we ended up getting. The same case goes for both Frenzies in addition to Scorponox as well. Now, with the run cycle square off, let's move on to the last bit of Animax for Transformers 2007, those being all the movement tests. Let's start off with some early Barricade Bumblebee fight scenes, and in this first one it's cool to see that they were considering giving Barricade swords. However, I think the spike ball that he ended up getting was a lot better and more unique. This takes us to the next fight scene where Barricade is throwing Bumblebee into a wall, and it seems like this test was created to determine how Bumblebee would fly and hit the wall at the power plant after Barricade kicks him. With that said, let's take a look at the last Bumblebee Barricade fight test. And here we can see Bumblebee and Barricade doing some wall riding, which is absolutely sick. Though we never got to see Barricade wall run, we did get to see Bumblebee do it in Dark of the Moon. With Barricade and Bumblebee's fight scene squared off, let's take a look at this one between Barricade and Jazz fighting each other with metal pipes in the middle of a city. Now though these two never squared off against each other in the film, they did in the Transformers 2007 video game. So maybe this animatic inspired the developers of the game to make you face off against Jazz when playing as Barricade. Or maybe this is just one big coincidence. Now moving on from the bad cop entirely, let's take a look at a few movement tests for the protoforms. And in this first one, we can see that this protoform has a weapon, which is particularly interesting since none of the protoforms had weapons until Revenge of the Fallen came around. Moving on to the next test, we can see this protoform landing and shaking the cars on the ground. This test might have served as a precursor for the scene where Starscream lands and kicks up the cars but I'm not 100% sure. Now moving on to the last protoform test, we have this one here of a protoform jumping, which is interesting to see since no protoforms jumped in the 2007 film. From here, let's take a look at some facial movement studies. Once again, starting off with Optimus, we can see this is a test for how his battle mask would come off. If you look carefully, the battle mask kind of morphs into his face, while in the film it transformed into the sides of his helmet. With that said, let's move on to the last facial movement study, which is for Frenzy. And here we can see that they were playing around with how his eyes and mandibles would move. And what we see here is pretty accurate to what we got in the final film. With those two studies squared off, let's move on to the final three Animax available to us. First up, we have a fight test for Bumblebee. And in this animatic, he's fighting a red version of himself. Something interesting to note here is that it seems like Bumblebee at one point was going to have double cannons, and he would have used them to do a rocket jump. It seems like this concept evolved into Ironhide having the double cannons and being the one to perform the rocket jump. Moving on to the next animatic, we have a test for how the tanks would move in the air and hit the ground after Blackout tossed them. And when you compare this animatic to the scene in the film, it's pretty faithful to what we ended up getting, especially the damage done to the tank treads. Now moving on to the last and final animatic for Transformers 2007. It would be this very early fight test for what appears to be Bumblebee fighting off some decisions 
Decepticons. Now the most interesting part about this animatic would be the part where this Decepticon causes Bumblebee to fall off the building. And as you can see this looks a lot like the scene where Megatron tackles Optimus off the building. And if you remember this clip from this animatic was intercut with the scene where Sam refuses to give Megatron the AllSpark. To give a possible explanation as to why this happened, it's possible that the animatic that we see here was likely just a proof of concept to see what the robots would look like while fighting, and this one particular part would go on to make it into the film. This of course is just pure speculation, so if you guys have any other potential answers as to why this could be the case, feel free to let me know. And with all the 2007 animatics squared off, let's now dive headfirst into all the ones for Revenge of the Fallen. First off, we have this one of Skids and Mufflap scanning their vehicles, and right off the bat, this version of the scene is a lot better than the one we ended up getting in the final film. Since in the film they don't even scan their vehicle modes and kind of just morph into them instead of transforming. I love the fact that they're actually using their eyes to scan the vehicles, since we never saw a transformer scan their vehicle in this manner besides Jazz. However, that's more of an outlier since we got a first person shot for Jazz and not a third person shot like the one we see here. Another thing to point out here is that their vehicle modes look a little different compared to the film. That's because their vehicle modes are based off the concept art designs for the Chevy B and Trax. Now something to point out in this scene is that it appears that it was meant to take place at night. However, the film has it set to daytime. Lastly, if you look really close, you can see Bumblebee in the background. Now this detail is particularly interesting since in the film as we know he did not show up at Nest. That was because he was still playing the role of Sam's guardian. So it's interesting to see that at one point he would have been at the base with the boys. And as we know this does end up happening in Dark of the Moon. Moving on to the next animatic we have this short scene of Soundwave hacking a military satellite. There's not too terribly much to say besides the fact that his design is based on his concept art. Now taking a look at the next animatic, we have one for the scene where Megatron travels to the Nemesis. And something interesting to note is that it seems like we would have gotten more screen time of Megatron flying around in space. Another thing to point out here before moving on to the next is that the model for the Fallen looks really funny due to how low poly it is. Now taking a look at the next animatic, this one is particularly interesting. Since a barricade never appeared in Revenge of the Fallen, so this could potentially mean that at one point he was going to star in the film. Unfortunately, we can only speculate on why this animatic was created and what it was intended for. Now moving on to the next animatic, we have this quick one of Megatron after he's resurrected by the Constructicons. And this one is actually very exciting to see since Megatron has scrap metal's parts on him. As we know at the end of the 2007 film, Megatron's left arm and right leg were taken off of him before he was dumped into the ocean. And in Revenge of the Fallen, the Decepticons tore apart scrap metal in order to rebuild Megatron. The thing is, in the film, we never saw scrap metal's parts on Megatron, since the AllSpark reformatted him right there and then. So it's awesome to see that at one point he was going to keep the parts. Now taking a look at the next animatic we have this one of Wheelie trying to steal the AllSpark shard from Michaela's safe. There is not too much to note here besides the fact that his design is based off of his concept art, and that he would have struggled a little bit more to reach the safe before going to grab the boxes. Now moving on to the next animatic. Here we have the one of the aircraft carrier sinking. Just like for the wheelie animatic, there is not too terribly much to say here, besides the fact that the general camera movements that we see here are relatively the same compared to what we ended up getting in the final film. Now moving on to the next animatic, we have a handful of various different versions for the forest battle. Some of the key highlights is that Megatron would have engaged Optimus in his 2007 jet mode, instead of his tank mode that he got from his new body. That is because early on Megatron was planned to be a triple changer, and this exact same scene plays out in the Revenge of the Fallen movie adaptation comic. As for why this idea was dropped is still unknown. As for some other highlights, Michaela was originally going to be with Sam during the forest battle, but in the film it was just Sam. Furthermore, it seems like Optimus would have used both of his swords early on in the battle, compared to him only using both after he's blasted by Megatron. Another highlight would be that Megatron would have originally been able to stand on his own pretty well, unlike in the film where he gets absolutely destroyed. Another thing that was cool to see was that Optimus was going to attempt to kick Megatron's face, while in the film Megatron is the one to do the kick. 
Another thing to point out in these animatics is the way that Grindor gets killed. In one of them, he gets stabbed through the chest after losing his sword fight with Prime. In another, Prime would have kicked Flipped off a star scream in order to plunge his hooks into Grindor's face. And in the last one, he would have used the momentum from hooking onto Grindor's face in order to kick star scream away and decapitate Grindor. Another thing that is cool in this iteration is that Grindor would have attempted to take the sword out immediately, instead of leaving it in there for some time like he did in the film. Now something that you might have not noticed is the camera placement for this shot. This is actually the inverse of what we got in the film, and I honestly like this perspective better compared to what we ended up getting. Lastly, one of the ways Optimus was going to be taken out was pretty cool. In the version where he kills Grindor by stabbing him, he would have then killed Starscream. But before he could react, Megatron would have backstabbed Optimus. And I think this would have been a better death scene for Optimus, since him looking around and somehow not hearing Megatron doesn't make much sense. And when you compare that death scene to this one, this is more realistic since he wouldn't have the time to react to Megatron's presence. Now, though I'm not the biggest fan of Starscream being killed here, this would have been the death scene he deserved compared to him being killed by Sam in Dark of the Moon. Now, that's enough talk on my part about the forest battle animatic. Let's now take a look at another animatic, and here we have the scene where Jetfire wakes up. Now something you can notice right off the bat is that Jetfire looks completely different here. That's because like everyone else, his pre-visualization design was based off of early concept art. Something really interesting in this animatic is that it contains a scrapped scene. Originally, Jetfire was going to drop his missiles. However, he wasn't able to pick them back up because his back wouldn't let him. It's unknown how far into production this idea got before being scrapped. However, we do have a piece of concept art for his missiles. But if we take a look at the film itself, we do get a comedic scene of Jetfire's missile firing in the wrong direction. So maybe this scene was retooled into the one we got. Now jumping headfirst into the next animatic, here we have one for the scene where the kitchen bots come to life. Right off the bat, there's a lot of stuff that did not make it into the final film, such as these phone bots, this hand mixer bot, and the crockpot bot. We also get this scene of the microwave bot putting one of the phone bots inside of him. This is a scene that unfortunately did not make it into the final film, but we do have a piece of concept art for it. Furthermore, there's a scene where the water Sam uses to put out the fire gets the attention of Dickbot, and he sends everyone upstairs to check out what's going on. This is a scene that would have benefited staying in the film, since the kitchen cons kinda just go upstairs without being prompted to do so, while here they have a reason. And interestingly enough, this scene made it into the When Robots Attack storybook. Another thing you might have noticed is that some of the designs for the kitchen bots look vastly different compared to what we ended up getting. And this is actually not a fault of concept art. This is because the design team had to create these characters from scratch since no concept art was created for these guys just yet. And what they created here served as a blueprint for what we ended up getting. As you can see, some designs stayed relatively the same, whereas others got a major overhaul. Something that is interesting is that though the hand mixer bot never made it into the final cut, he would appear in the When Robots Attack storybook. Now, the last major thing to point out here is that Judy Witwicky is being attacked by a Decepticon. As we know in the film, she runs out of the house with a waffle iron on her head. The character that we see here is supposed to be the waffle iron, but the thing is, we never see his robot mode in the film. To this day, it's unknown why this change was made for the final film. Now, taking a look at the next animatic, we have this one for the opening scene where the Fallen is not too happy seeing the humans. This design for the Fallen is definitely based off of some early concept art. However, it seems like the exact piece of art that they used as a reference hasn't been archived on the web. Something that is interesting in this scene is that when the Fallen looks at the Harvester, we can see that the base of the pyramid is starting to take shape, which is something that was not present in the final film. Another thing that is fascinating is that we get the grand reveal of the Harvester when the Fallen looks at it, while in the film we get to see it when the prehistoric humans do. Furthermore, the scene where the Fallen picks up the human and throws him happens right before the reveal of the Harvester, while in the film it was the last thing to happen before the title screen played, and we didn't get to see the guy hit the ground. Now taking a look at the next animatic, we have this one of Sam and friends being taken to the abandoned factory. Something to take note of here is that Optimus takes out Starscream and Megatron fairly quickly, compared to the film version where it takes him a little bit of time. We also don't have that amazing flip sequence since Optimus pulls out his blasters as soon as he lands. Another cool thing this animatic shows is how Bumblebee, Michaela, and Leo leave the factory. In the film, we just see Bumblebee, Michaela, and Leo appear outside after Optimus takes care of business, leaving 
leaving it up to our imagination as to how they got out. So, it's unfortunate that this part of the scene did not make it into the final film. Now jumping into the next animatic, we have one for the scene where Optimus receives Jetfire's parts. Now something you can immediately notice here is that Ratchet is the one to transplant Jetfire's parts onto Optimus instead of Jolt. That's because Jolt was a very last minute addition to the film. Because of him being such a late addition to the film, he only appeared in robot mode for three scenes of the movie, and has no speaking lines whatsoever. He even abruptly disappears from the Autobot vehicle mode group shot where he appears for the first time. Furthermore, he didn't appear in any of the tie-in comics, books, or video games until seven months after the film had come out. With that said, let's move on to the next animatic, and here we have the scene where Prime's lifeless body is dropped into Egypt. And this scene is a heck of a lot better compared to what we ended up getting in the film, since here we get to see this awesome POV shot of the soldiers jumping out with Prime's body, while in the film we only got to see his body get dropped from afar. With that animax squared off, let's dive into the next one, and here we have the scene where Ravage and Reedman steal the Allspark fragment. Some major changes compared to the film was that Ravage would have landed in the water during the day, and would have waited till nighttime until entering the base, unlike in the film where it's it's already nighttime and he enters it right away. I also find it cool that he would have been able to turn himself into a fish-like thing to swim, but I do prefer how they made him swim in the final film. Another crazy thing in this animatic is the death scene for the soldier that Reedman kills. It would have been a lot more gruesome with the soldier being split in half. This was probably cut and changed to the version we got to keep the movie at a PG-13 rating. Now, the last thing to talk about with this animatic is its ending, which surprisingly fixes a few plot holes. Here we get to see Reedman detransform and go back inside of Ravage, Scapel collecting the Allspark fragment and Ravage flying away. This is important since in the film we don't know what happened to Reedman after he ran off. We never saw how Scapel got the Allspark fragment since it was last seen with Reedman, and we never got to find out how Ravage got off Diego Garcia and made it back to Soundwave. This little scene right here fixed all of those plot holes, so it's a shame that we never got to see it in the final film. With that said, let's take a look at the next animatic, and here we have the scene where Bumblebee is fighting Rampage. Something right off the bat that you can notice here is that Rampage is yellow while in the film he was red. You see, originally Rampage was supposed to be yellow, evident by his concept art. However, along the way, his color scheme would be changed to red. This was likely done since having two yellow robots fighting each other would be hard for audiences to distinguish who was who. Now something that is pretty interesting in this animatic is that Ravage is nowhere to be seen, meaning his addition to this fight scene must have been added later on. Lastly, the shot where Rampage almost crushes Michaela was filmed but never made it into the final cut. With this animatic squared off, let's take a look at a few for the Shanghai battle. Some of the many highlights would be Optimus driving out of the C-17. This version, in my opinion, is slightly cooler than what we got in the film, since we get this close-up shot of the C-17 flying below buildings. I also like how the cargo hold opens in this animatic more compared to the film. Another highlight would be the scene of Ironhide launching the soldiers off of him right before he transforms. This would have been a cool segment to see, however, in the film the soldiers just get off by themselves. Now, another thing that is interesting in this animatic would be Demolisher. As you guys can see, he is red here while in the film he was white. That's because Demolisher's color scheme is based off of his concept art colors, which made it up all the way to the CGI modeling phase. Why his OG color scheme was scrapped in favor for a white one is anyone's guess. However, his red color scheme wouldn't be entirely scrapped since it would be used for another character named Scavenger, who made up the upper torso of Devastator. Now, another cool thing with Scavenger is that we can see him shoot missiles at the soldiers. Now, though he also does this in the film, we don't physically see him do it, nor do we see the missile trails, since in the film we just see explosions on the ground causing the soldiers to fly back. The Transformers Revenge of the Fallen video game would have a more fateful adaptation of this ability, having him shoot missiles at you that you would have to dodge. Now, another interesting thing to point out would be Demolisher's death. Instead of Ironhide firing at the bottom tire, he would have taken out the top, causing Demolisher to lose his balance and crash into a suburban neighborhood, taking out several family homes. In the film, however, he crashes into a vacant train yard. This change was likely made since having the bots force Demolisher to crash into a neighborhood would not paint them as heroes. Another highlight from the Shanghai Battle animatics would have to be Sideways. Unlike in the film where he just ran away from the Autobots, 
Here he would have actively caused destruction, going out of his way to kill several Ness soldiers. Now something you probably already noticed is that in this animatic sideways is a Lamborghini and not an Audi R8. And that's partly because of his concept art which envisioned him as a Lamborghini. However, the other part was actually due to Audi, which ended up causing his role in the film to be a lot shorter compared to this animatic. You see, due to licensing issues with Audi and the writer strike, Sideways' role was drastically altered, and he was nearly taken out of the movie. Originally, Sideways was going to escape the first wave of his Autobot pursuers by using Demolisher as a distraction. After Demolisher's death, Sideways would have been cornered and engaged by Sideswipe in robot mode. At this point, it would have been Sideways and not Demolisher who would have dropped a Fallen's name. Ultimately, this scene was never finished, Audi backed out of the licensing agreement, and the scene was rewritten to focus on Demolisher, letting him be the one to drop the Fallen's name. Audi later decided that they did want the product to be featured, and so the pre-visualization animation of Sideswipe bisecting a Lamborghini was reworked to feature an Audi R8. Now, funny enough, if you look closely, when Sideways is cut in half, you can actually see his head. This is a detail that I wish would have made it to the final film due to how funny it is. Now, the last thing I want to mention about Sideways in this animatic is the fact that he was planned to get damaged in vehicle mode, evident by him losing his roof, and yet he was still able to transform just fine. This is a concept I wish that was explored further in the movies, since we really never got this level of damage besides Prime's war-torn truck mode in Age of Extinction. Now, the last thing I want to bring up in this animatic is some details about the motorcycles that we see. As we know, in Revenge of the Fallen, there were three motorcycle characters, RC, Alita 1, and Chromia. And at one point during production, these three gals were going to combine, evident by this piece of concept art. And we can see this combined mode right here, which is pretty sick. However, what's more sick is that there was supposed to be two more motorcycle characters, which we actually have concept art for. One that would have been a V-Rex motorcycle, and the other a Triumph motorcycle. And these two guys appeared in this animatic attacking sideways. Another surprise that this animatic shows us is this silver motorcycle bot. Though we don't have any concept art for its robot mode, the closest thing I could find would be this one where a silver bike makes up the leg of the RC combiner. Now, with all the Shanghai animatics squared off, let's take Take a look at the second to last Revenge of the Fallen animatic, that being the one where Sam and Michaela are hiding from the Decepticons in Egypt. Something very interesting here is that Megatron would have participated in the hunt. However, in the film, he just chills on top of the Star Harvester. Another thing that did not make it into the film would be this awesome POV shot of the bullet Starscream fires. With that said, let's move on to the final Revenge of the Fallen animatic that I deliberately saved for last. That being the one for the Devastator combination scene. Something you can immediately point out is that Devi looks very different. That's because his design is based on early concept art. And the same case goes for both Skids and Mudflap. Now, something very interesting about this early concept art for Devastator is that Long Haul or another dump truck bot would have made up the head instead of Mixmaster, which is really strange to think about. Another strange thing is all the duplicate construction vehicles that form up Devastator. It's likely that most of these were just placeholders since the animators likely did not know what the final vehicles would end up being. Now a shot that I wish we would have gotten in the film is this one of all the charred up bits on the ground which would have been really cool to see. Another thing that would have been cool to see is the jets flying past Devastator. Devastator, but I can see why this was cut due to them not really serving any purpose. As for some other shots I wish we got in the film, this scene of Skids tripping over this metal beam would have been pretty funny to see, in addition to this scene where Skids and Mudflap have to run from Devastator's legs so they don't get crushed. Now moving back to some differences between this animatic and the final film, this animatic shows that the Fallen was supposed to be the one to take out the helicopter instead of Megatron. This would have been a great way to showcase the Fallen as a more powerful antagonist, and to give him some more much needed screen time. Another difference in this scene is that Skids and Mudflap would have actually climbed up the pyramid to confront Devastator, which would have been awesome to see. And with that said, that covers all the Revenge of the Fallen animatics, so now let's dive headfirst into all the ones for Dark of the Moon. The first one to take a look at is the scene where Carly enters the apartment, and the key takeaway here is that the animatic is titled Michaela instead of Carly. That is because when Dark of the Moon was being written, Aaron Kruger was anticipating 
anticipating for Megan Fox to come back and reprise her role as Michaela Baines. However, as we know, Fox never starred in the film and was replaced by Rosie Huntington Whiteley, who played the character of Carly Spencer. This was because she was fired from the Transformers 3 production, due to her comments comparing Michael Bay to Adolf Hitler. As a side effect of this, we will be seeing Michaela's animatic model for the animatic scenes that Carly stars in. With that said, let's now take a look at the next animatic, which is the iconic scene where the driller attacks the building. First off, it's very interesting to see that the Decepticon protoform that enters the building would have had two blasters, since in the film he only had one. Another thing that stood out to me is the soldier that falls out the building. You see, in the movie when our heroes are sliding towards the window, Stone is the only one who didn't get to safety in time and fell to his death. However, in the next shot, Stone is literally seen alive in the background, and he later goes on to help take out Decepticons and survives all the way to the end of the movie. I always thought that this was a gag added in last minute which would explain the continuity error, however this was planned from the get-go, which is even more confusing, and puts into question why they did not just CGI in a random generic soldier instead of having Josh Kelly, the actor who plays Stone, slide out of the building. And if you guys have any explanations for this, please let me know since I'm still confused confused about this. Moving on from this point, something cool in this animatic that does not appear in the film would be this shot of Shockwave looking at Epsan scanning him. This would have been so cool to see since it gives us a first person perspective for Shockwave, showing us that he constantly sees red. No wonder why he's mad all the time. Now moving along to another cool thing in this animatic, it's actually an easter egg from the animators. When the driller tears up the street, we can see this poster for Revenge of the Fallen on this bus shelter. With that said, as for some other cool things in this animatic, this shot of the camera under Shockwave while the driller rises would have been really cool to see, but the version we got in the final film was also pretty solid. Now, the last thing in this animatic that I want to bring up would be that it's funny to see that the driller does not play around, since he goes out of his way to kill innocent civilians. With this animatic squared off, let's take a look at the scene where Sentinel is setting up the pillars, and the main thing to take note here is that Sentinel has to physically set up the pillars, unlike in the film where he could just float them to where they needed to go, and I personally think that the film version is a lot better due to it looking cooler. Now moving on to the next animatic, we have the scene for Laserbeak's death, and I think this version of his death is a lot better than what we ended up getting in the film. The main reason for that is because in the film Sam is somehow able to manhandle Laserbeak and keep him at bay so Bumblebee can blast him. However, here his tail would have gotten stuck forcing him to stay close to Sam. Besides this, some other changes to the scene that were made was that Carly turns away right as Sam shows up, forcing him to enter the apartment, while in the film Sam just enters to find Carly. Lastly, something I wish we got to see in the film was Bumblebee blasting Laserbeak away, which would have been pretty funny to see. The last highlight in this animatic to take note of is that the ship would have partly crashed into a building, unlike in the film where it crashed in the middle of a street. As for how Sam was able to hang on to the fighter without dying is anyone's guess. Now taking a look at the next animatic, we have this one of Carly confronting Megatron. And an early concept here that I would have preferred seeing in the film was the Autobots and Decepticons fighting behind Carly, instead of the orbital assault carriers falling from the sky. Another early concept that I like here compared to the film is that Megatron would have slammed his arm onto the ground, causing Carly to fall back. As we know in the film, Megatron just swings his arm which makes her fall, and upon comparing this to the animatic, the animatic version is clearly more intimidating. Now moving along to the next animatic, here we have a scene where the Decepticons are popping off in Chicago. The only highlight to note here is that it seems like the concept of humans turning into skeletons wasn't a thing when this animatic was created, since here we can see them all charred up and this guy's arm pops off after he explodes. Lastly, we can see the concept art design for Crankcase here, which I actually prefer over the final design since it has more car parts on it. Now jumping into the next animatic, we have one for the scene where the humans ambush the Decepticons. Something to note right off the bat is that Barricade is absent here, meaning that he must have been a later addition to this scene. Another thing to point out here is that Shockwave would have killed Zimmerman. In the film, Zimmerman is the one to shoot Shockwave in the neck with a grenade launcher, and he barely survives by landing on a taxi. However, here Shockwave would have just grabbed him and thrown him into a building and I think this would have been cool to see since it would have shown that Shockwave would have been a true force to be reckoned with which is something that the film fumbled pretty hard on. It's also cool to see that we would have gotten a scene of Lennox fighting Shockwave one-on-one. -on -one. This is something we kinda got in the film, but 
not to this extent. Something that is interesting in this animatic is that the Wreckers are not present, since in the film they were the ones to make Shockwave retreat. It's also interesting to see that Prime coming in to save the day happens the second after the soldiers make Shockwave retreat. The film definitely did this better since it gave some breathing room between these two scenes. Now, the last thing in this animatic to point out is that it seems like Optimus would have spared Shockwave, since here we can see that Prime only cuts off his arm, and uses it to deactivate the control pillar, unlike in a film where he digs around in Shockwave's head and pulls out his eye. Some other early concepts that are present here is that Prime's jetpack would have transformed into his body, Prime would have just punched Shockwave, and that Sentinel Prime would have slid down the building with his hand. The film, in my opinion, handled all of these better, with Prime dismounting the jetpack, giving Prime knuckle spikes, and Sentinel using his sword in order to get down. With this animax square, off, let's take a look at the next one, and here we have a scene of the Nest soldiers wingsuiting into Chicago. Compared to the film, this animatic has more aerial shots of the Decepticon fighters, and it also has a shot of the soldiers safely landing on the ground after they fly through the building. This is a shot that I wish we got to see, since we only got to see them opening their parachutes in the film. With that said, let's now take a look at the next animatic, which is the scene where the Autobots return. A very interesting early concept here is that Bumblebee was going to be the one to shoot down the fighter instead of Optimus Prime. Furthermore, it looks like we would have gotten a POV shot from the Decepticon piloting the fighter as he attacks the humans, which is something I wish we ended up getting. Another thing that is interesting is that Carly is present in this scene. This is strange since in the film she was captured by Dylan during this time, and as we know her being captured was the reason why Sam and the gang went to Chicago, so the motive behind why the group is here now is a mystery. Lastly, we can see the Wreckers tearing apart the Decepticon pilot. Led Foot and Topspin have their correct colors, but Roadbuster here is orange. That's because his design here is using his concept art colors, and in that concept art he had a chainsaw, which despite being an accessory for most of his toys, it sadly was a weapon he did not use in the film. Now moving on to the second to last Dark of the Moon animatic, we have this one for Starscream's death. Something interesting to note here is that Carly is nowhere to be seen, with it just being Sam and Starscream. The shot of Starscream firing bullets into the bus as Sam runs out would have been cool to see, but I think what we got in the final film with Starscream using his saw was much better. Now, the main thing with this animatic is that unlike in the film where Sam uses the boomstick to blind Starscream, he instead jams the boomstick into Starscream's mouth. This doesn't really make much sense since Starscream could have just pulled it out yet the boomstick still ends up killing him. The film version, in my opinion, did a much better job, since with him at least blinded, it makes it more plausible that he wasn't physically able to get the bomb out due to the pain of it being jammed in his eye. And with that said, let's finally move on to the final Dark of the Moon animatic. That being the scene where the Autobots get captured. And there's a ton of juicy things to talk about here. The most interesting of all being that Mirage is the one to be gunned down instead of Wheeljack. It's also interesting to see that Wheeljack is entirely missing from this version of the scene, alluding to the fact that he might have died elsewhere in a different animatic that we don't have access to, which would give an explanation for his absence. Another character that is missing from this scene is Barricade, but considering the fact that he was missing from the other animatic, it's likely his inclusion in the film was a late addition. Some other interesting things in this scene to point out is that Bumblebee was going to get his arm shot off. This is something I wish made it into the final film since it would have made audiences think that the Bumblemeister could have actually died. It's also interesting to see that a protoform was going to be the one to potentially kill Bumblebee instead of Soundwave. Speaking of Soundwave, his death was going to be a lot more violent. B would have shot both of his legs off, and when he tried to crawl away, Bumblebee would have stepped on his arm and blasted his head right off his body before crushing it to bits. And man, that's pretty brutal. As for some other things to talk about, it seems like Ratchet would have picked up a protoform's gun, and Brains and Wheelie would have pressed some random buttons to crash the mothership instead of ripping out wires like they did in the film. Speaking of Brains, we can see that his design here is based off of his early concept art, evident by the tires by his hip. I always wondered what the concept art design for Brains would have transformed into, since it surely wasn't going to be a laptop. 
and though he had this design in Age of Extinction, he unfortunately never transformed. And with all those Dark of the Moon Animax squared off, let's take a look at the handful that we have for Age of Extinction. Starting off with the scene where the Autobots meet the Dinobots, we can see right off the bat that Drift's design is based off of his concept art. The reason why his color scheme ended up changing to blue was because the orange variant of the Bugatti Veyron that they were planning on using for him was all sold out, and so they had to get a blue one instead. Another thing to talk about in this animatic is Grimlock. In this animatic, he just falls over and the dust conceals his transformation. The film, in my opinion, did a much better job with him actually transforming. Something cool about Grimlock that we can see is that he is sporting that awesome concept art design. With that said, let's cruise over to the next animatic, and here we have the scene of Bumblebee crashing the orbital assault carrier. The main difference with this animatic compared to the film is that Kate and company crash right through the trailer of a truck, while in the film, they just clip the back of a Bud Light truck. With that squared off, the next animatic we have is the scene where Hound is taking on the KSI drone army. And in both of these shots, we can see Hound do wielding weapons, which is something we barely got to see in the film. With this animatic wrapped up, let's take a look at another one. And here we have the scene of Crosshairs taking out the orbital assault carriers. Interestingly enough, he uses a grapple hook to launch himself onto one. This is pretty interesting since this gadget originated from Crosshairs' early concept art, and was later given to Bumblebee in the final film. With that said, let's move on to our second to last animatic for Age of Extinction. And here we have the scene of Lockdown Ship causing some havoc in Hong Kong. The destruction we see here was definitely expanded upon in order to give us the amazing carnage we saw in the film. With that said, it's time to move on to our last Age of Extinction animatic, which would be the scene where the Autobots charge in on the Dinobots. And something that is very interesting here is that we can see Bumblebee on strafe. This is significant since in the film he was with Hound fighting off the drones when Prime and the boys came in to help meaning that in an earlier draft it was just Hound facing off against everyone. It's also interesting to see that Lockdown's mercenaries would have attacked the Autobots during their charge, since in the film they don't attack until a while after it. Something that is cool to see here is this variant of Crosshairs' pre-visualization design, which looks spot on to his concept art design. Another thing that is cool to see here is that Optimus is actually using his shield as a shield, since in the version we ended up getting he just uses the blaster portion of it for this scene. Last Lastly, it's cool to see that Optimus would have done this awesome sweep of his sword to take out the drones, which is something that I wish we got to see. And with that last Age of Extinction animatic squared off, let's now move on to all the ones for Transformers The Last Night. And unfortunately, we only have one to look at. That being the scene where Cybertron is about to crash into the moon. And interestingly enough, the shot that we got in the final film was from Cybertron's perspective. Unlike here, where we get the perspective of the moon. And just like that, that was all the animatics that we currently have access to for the five Michael Bay Transformers movies. If you're still in the mood for some more forgotten media, check out this video on how one little Amazon system error changed the entire ending for Dark of the Moon.